Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world right now. I am the plant-based nutritionista, and I am here to inspire you to take your health back one meal at a time by eating more plants. As you know, my podcast, In the Kitchen with the Plant-Based Nutritionista, is designed to build a robust community in health around each and every one of you by bringing into my kitchen experts and just, you know, regular people too from the community to hear some of the conversations that I'm having with my mentors, my physicians, my colleagues, professors, faith leaders, family, friends, you name it. They up in my kitchen, y'all, either in person or virtually. So we have addressed so many things so far as it relates to our health, our wellness, our, our fitness, but we focused a lot on nutrition, of course, but we've also dug into financial, occupational, psychological, mental health, spiritual health, policy, public health, all these things. You're probably saying, why? Well, it's because your health and your wellness are complex. And as you know, making decisions about your health and wellness is equally, if not as more complex. So through this podcast, I aim to inspire you and empower you with information to reclaim your health and well-being one decision and one meal at a time. Today we have a phenomenal woman on deck, none other than the Dr. Carlita L. Warren. Dr. Warren has been licensed and, and certified as an athletic trainer for more than 20 years years. She's got a PhD, y'all, in athletic training. She's also the founder and owner of the Kizo Effect. Now, this is a health-conscious organization that helps to improve a person's quality of life through healthy lifestyle choices, injury prevention, recovery from injury, and health consumer empowering empowerment. In addition, the Kizo Effect is a consulting firm for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. We don't hear about that accessibility too often, guys. But anyway, it's a consulting firm for DEIA in healthcare and health professions education. We definitely need it there as well. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is without further ado that I have the esteemed honor and privilege and blessing to present to some and introduce to others my friend and colleague, me, Dr. Carlita Warren. Woo! Oh my goodness. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ethel, for having me. It is a privilege and an honor to be here with you. And oh man, you have me so excited right now. Yeah. I love talking about health and wellness and having people be empowered to take control of their health. So thank you so much for inviting me today. You are so welcome. I'm glad you're pumped. And I know our listeners are pumped too. So I just want people to understand like how you are just so fully accomplished. I like to say fully loaded. And I want to just dive right into the meat and potatoes of who you are and what you do. And, and through the, this, this discussion, we'll answer some basic things that our viewers might want to know and understand like what is an athletic trainer. Yes, guys, it's more than just Sunday football. Um, it's more than that. So you have uh, such a uniquely cultivated background where you've recognized this gap or need in healthcare and you've managed to blend some very complex sciences to address these very key issues, um, not just for differently abled people, but for some of us able-bodied people as well. Can you tell us more about what this need is that you identified it, how you even recognized it, and what your vision is for bridging the gap with evidence-based and sustainable solutions? Wow, that is a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would probably say that um, I first identified the need. Um, it was twofold. So let just briefly, I want to talk about what actually sparked my interest in um, healthcare and providing um, quality healthcare for individuals. And it was um, a family member, I won't say who, uh, but there was a family member who um, him uh, and uh, my cousin were in a motorcycle accident. And um, I remember as a teenager, just going through that process of hearing about them having to go through um, rehabilitation because it was a very serious accident. Um, and um, it really sparked my interest in healthcare. I thought at first I wanted to be a dermatologist. Um, and then after 
them having that experience and hearing some of the stories of my cousin and her physical therapy experience, it really sparked my interest in um, rehabilitation and healthcare. Now, to be quite honest, I thought I was going to go to college to be a physical therapist um, after I decided to let go of the dermatology um, notion. Uh, and then at first I said, well, maybe I want to be a doctor, but I really was interested in, in um, the aspect of returning a person back to whatever their normal activities were or whatever the things were that they enjoyed doing. And so physical therapy is what I thought I wanted to do. Um, and I went to college <laughs> and was a pre-physical therapy major. And uh, the school that I went to, what I enjoyed most is that they would allow us to do some observations, um, if you will, or some clinical observation rotations to make sure that this is something that we really wanted to do. And what we quickly discovered is, yes, I love rehabilitation. Um, I love seeing someone recover from injury, but I was also extremely um, intrigued by um, just the, the examination and the diagnosis component of it. But we also discovered that if it was um, a child um, or if it was an older adult, I would be a little lenient and say, okay, you don't have to do that exercise if it hurts. And so they say, you might want to think about the, the athletic population <laughs> or people who um, have a truly vested interest um, like athletes do when you think about it, um, particularly professional athletes, to get back to um, whatever their sport is. And so I was introduced to athletic training in that regard. Um, what ended up happening is in all of my experiences, and I'm sure we'll dive deeper into this a little later, but I noticed a gap of um, access to holistic health care or health care in general based on either location, um, so geographic location, um, finances, um, the accessibility in the sense of if it was uh, when I worked in a high school setting, um, athletes not being able to go get the proper care that they needed or see the, the specialist that they needed um, because their parents had to work and sometimes work two jobs. And so they didn't have that accessibility to get to a physician's office at the designated times that um, physicians um, had hours. And so I started looking at that and looking at the lack of access and the inequities that were in healthcare, and it really took me in a different direction. While I absolutely love um, being the primary um, care um, person and treating injuries, evaluating injuries, I started veering toward some of the inequities in healthcare um, and the lack of access, um, the lack of diversity um, in healthcare, and I've been doing that ever since. So I guess identifying that need, um, as you asked, it was really looking at what are these factors we now know and um, define them as the social determinants of health, but what are these factors that are keeping people from having the access that they need to quality health care on a consistent basis? And so that's really where it began. Um, and my vision to bridge the gap is to just understanding that I can't be all things to all people, but I can certainly start to make a difference and start to collaborate um, with other healthcare professionals who have the same mission and vision as myself, which is to make sure that um, quality healthcare is accessible for all, despite whatever the social determinants may be um, that they have. And so that's really how it started. Um, that's how the Kizo effect got started, because I wanted to see what I can do to not only bridge the gap through, through the patient side of it and making sure that the patients have what they need, but then also um, collaborating um, with healthcare providers to make sure that we are doing our part to make sure that healthcare is diverse, it's equitable, it's inclusive, and it's accessible. Wow, that was loaded. Um, <laughs> and I think that's really good because, you know, primary care doctors, they can't do it all. And I dare say they can't think of it all. And not one thing you mentioned was about Sunday football or professional basketball. Like you are talking about everyday people who get injured, who need to access rehabilitative care like the average person like me who likes to play sports as an adult that gets that could get injured 
So I've had better outcomes with athletic training, but I have never made the connection like you did with overall healthcare. Like, I need every primary care provider listening to like perk your ears up right now because this is actually something that can support uh, your clinic, not just from athletic training, but even from the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility piece. Like, think about it. Is your training nine to seven? How can I get there? If I live in a rural community, like maybe I can't show up till eight at night, right? Because I'm a farmer. <laughs> Like, there's just so much there. And I think that's awesome. You've also done some research, some published things that you published uh, around this. Can you tell us about what that is and, you know, how it even connects with us today? Sure, absolutely. So um, two publications that I have um, presently, uh, one deals with um, racial and ethnic differences and um, the functional outcomes of um, stroke patients. And we just looked at um, what were those differences in uh, their mobility scores um, or their um, functional outcomes and scores. And we did find some, some differences um, in the time, length of time that they were in inpatient rehabilitation um, centers and in their overall recovery and their ability to either function um, and or um, their cognitive outcomes. So uh, we are identifying that there are have been some racial and ethnic differences, but what we need to do now is take it a step further and look at what are the causes, causes of those particular um, differences. Um, and what we did find uh, with the differences is that um, in um, our um, Black or African-American um, population, and um, in our Latino um, or Latina population, um, there were some racial and ethnic differences in cognitive um, functioning and or um, um, mobility function um, or motor functioning after um, inpatient rehab and that they had a shorter length of stay um, in um, inpatient rehabilitation um, centers. And so we're looking at it from the perspective of the patient, but then also whether there is an educational piece um, to bring some more culturally um, relevant or um, culturally competent um, practices into um, healthcare centers to make sure that the patient holistically um, is being um, cared for. And so th that's the next step in the research that we did. We identified those differences. Uh, and the next step would be to now look at what we can do as clinicians um, and as healthcare providers to make sure that we are practicing culturally relevant, culturally competent care to um, ensure that those uh, differences are mitigated. Um, we also looked at racial and ethnic differences in traumatic brain injury with the same outcome. So we looked at motor function um, and we looked at cognitive function and found some differences as well. So we would like to take the same approach and now look at how we can uh, mitigate those um, differences as well. A lot of times what we're finding is um, that what may be necessary is to just go in and provide some professional development for healthcare providers to make sure that um, when we are discussing patient-centered care, which I do believe that all healthcare um, providers are focused on patient-centered care, but then making sure that we are considering um, those culturally relevant um, pieces and elements to that as well, because we can practice patient-centered care and not have it necessarily be culturally relevant. And so we want to make sure that we are integrating um, the culturally relevant um, components of that as well. And that may be um, for some that we include the family in the rehabilitation process as well. In certain cultures, um, the family plays a huge role in um, the decision making um, for healthcare. And so that's something that's just one small element that we can consider and think about. We can also um, think about how we're integrating the patient into their care or their rehabilitation plan and making sure that we're meeting the needs that they have or any concerns that they may have. When we talk about evidence-based practice um, for healthcare, it is certainly um, based on um, the most current literature or evidence that's out there, but it's also our own clinical expertise and um, the patient's um, concerns, their needs, and what their desires um, and wishes are. Ooh, okay, small but mighty, right? <laughs> I, that, so again, you're talking about stroke patients, and they could also suffer traumatic brain injury from the stroke. And then you know, blows to the head traumatic brain injuries as well. It is so needed 
you 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 hit the nail on the head that you can practice patient centered care all day, but if you can't understand what I'm communicating to you through the lens of my culture, we are going to have differences in outcomes, differences in my my progress to go through recovery, uh, differences in experiences, feeling like you hear me, you see me in my humanity. Like I, I mean, it's needed. And as as someone who is uh, on the what do you say, upside, inside, uh, uh, walking out of a third brain injury. I I mean, clearly it, it's needed because when I say I hurt and my doctor looks at me and drops his head like, oh, you're just making it up. No, I'm not making it up. I'm explaining to you to, to the best that I can with the limited abilities that I have to communicate as I recover, something is all, but you're either treating me as the norm and what you think, or you're not taking me seriously. And you know what I realized throughout this whole ordeal, at least the third time, most of the doctors treating <laughs> brain injury have never had one themselves. So they cannot relate to what I am saying or to what a patient might be saying. And I think your work is so needed. And I hope that there are sponsors listening, funders listening to fund this because this isn't an attack on race. It's an attack on a lack of understanding of how to communicate with someone who's different than you. Point blank. I can go to another country and try to push nutrition and, and ignore their culture and be met with resistance and a brick wall and never make any progress. Or I can take time to assimilate and understand how they communicate, you know, what makes them thrive, you know, just get to know the stakeholders and you talked about training and professional development. That's so true. But you know, my background in, in project management and management, change management, and just people behavior suggests that maybe we can take that a step further. Let's go in the room with the practitioner, with the clinician. And like, you know how we do time studies just for patient flow and all that. And let's let's see how they're interacting. And then at the end of each visit, because I've done this before too for practices that want it to do better, to say, hey, you did great communicating with the patient, but here's what I heard that you did not address, or you said it this way, and I noticed their body language change. Let me tell you what this means in the context of their culture. And, and, and I had patients from all different walks of life, but when you're that third eye in the room, if you will, you can see that. And being able to then, and you're a great communicator, communicate that back, like, hey, we're on the same team try it this way. I had doctors say no one has ever critiqued me and I wanted to just bawl and cry or you know he's like you basically told me to go to hell and I didn't tell him this but this is how he was trying again his his culture how he's describing it it's like he basically told me to uh, to go to hell and I did a terrible job but I feel so loved and I was <laughs> like yeah so you know I didn't say that but I basically was able to address a concern that's been reoccurring in patient notes and you know staff complaints in a way where he still felt seen in his humanity and now we're dealing with other issues that's causing that so i just think most people don't get up wanting to demonstrate racial differences but unfortunately they do because it's ingrained inside of them they don't know it's there and again to buy it like unconscious bias and all that jazz so I feel like I don't want to talk anymore on this because I can go on and on. Yeah. <laughs> but you, the work you're doing is so needed. And I've lived it. I think that's where this passion is. I've lived it now, uh, you know, twice as an adult. And it, it's, it's needed. So, again, to the funders and sponsors who are watching, I don't care if you make cotton balls or, you know, I don't know, book covers. This mm -hmm. is such good research. And we would love for you to get behind it. Okay. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Well, thank you, because I do have some other ideas um, that I have been um, working on. I actually, I guess about two years ago now, maybe it was in 2021, um, I had the um, privilege to be a part of the Center for Health Equity Research um, Institute, SHARE Institute. What they do in the SHARE Institute is just teach us how to identify um, funding um, for um, community um, uh, 
equity, health equity research that we that we would like to do. And um, I wrote a a proposal um, and a specific aims um, worksheet to continue uh, my traumatic brain injury um, research, um, looking at racial and ethnic differences. I was just leave it there. Um, so I am looking to, to, to develop this a little further. And again, not to just point out the differences, but certainly to look at how we can then um, begin strategy to decrease and minimize um, those differences and make sure that we are providing that culturally responsible um, care to our patients to um, just try to mitigate any long-term effects that may occur. Um, that could be related to um, areas that we're not approaching with regard to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, health equity, um, making sure that we're not being exclusive in our practices and just making sure that we are meeting all of the needs from a holistic perspective um, for our patients to make sure that they they recover completely and um, return to optimal health. Um, and wellness and go, get back to whatever their activities of daily living may be, or if they are participating in sport, making sure that they're able to do that without any limitations or restrictions. And I, and you said something funny, you said, um, they, um, a lot of the physicians haven't had, um, um, brain injuries themselves. And I chuckled a little bit because I said, well, I haven't had one. Um, well, technically <laughs> there was a thought of me having a concussion um a couple of years ago um but i we don't necessarily have to experience the same injury to still have empathy and to make sure that we're practicing um from a holistic perspective and so we just want to get to the point where we're all um as healthcare providers practicing holistically um in, in culturally relevant ways, as I said. Um, and that just really requires us um, having the mentality that goes beyond what our healthcare system allows, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, the way our healthcare system is set up, we get the patients and we get them out quickly, but we might have to take a little extra time. So it may take 10 or 15 minutes longer um, when we are um, during our initial examination or evaluation or our follow-up appointments so that we can clearly identify what the prognosis is for that particular patient um, and articulate that to them and then collaborate with them and um, the rest of the healthcare team to make sure that they are receiving optimal care. Well, amen, touche to that, all of the above. You, you're right, you know, we don't, and I hope that's not what I was implying, but it, <laughs> it, you're right, you shouldn't, <laughs> I guess one is more empathetic when they've lived it than when they've not lived it. But you're absolutely right that it shouldn't take that for empathy to be displayed by practitioners. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll leave that there. But that you're absolutely 100% right. And that's where that training comes in. And maybe it the role play videos, you know, they have corny videos and training, but they really do paint the picture in very exaggerated ways. So I 100% support that because I can tell you, I wouldn't wish a brain injury on anyone, nor the recovery process. It's, it's a lot. I'll just say that. And uh, especially our stroke patients. So I got, I'm a part of a support group and I, I thought I was having issues. And then I met stroke patient. I was like, that never even crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. and here I am crying and whining. And these people really got some serious concerns or their mobility, like you said, has been impacted. But regardless, that empathy goes a long way with recovery. When you feel, and this is what people don't realize, that how our disease management physicians are trained, our medical doctors are trained. They're trained that if, if you believe it, your patient will believe it. If you're confident, your patient will have confidence. So even if you're wrong, and even if you're you're not sure, you better walk in that room and be confident because, you know, they studies suggest that that improves health outcomes or recovery outcomes. The part that makes me uh, cringe is like we're talking about disparities. <laughs> and if you believe something about me that may not be true or narrative that may not be true, and you come in with that confidence, and I can pick that up, which I can, 
then there's a disconnect. So now I'm looking for the next doctor who can help me because I don't think you hear me. I don't think you see me, which was a part of my experience. This ain't about me today. I just think this is a very needed discussion when we're talking about something as delicate and complex as healing the the neurological system, which touches every so neuromuscular really it touches everything. And we're seeing now one of my first speakers was a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're starting to see strokes in 30 and 40 year olds. Right. So you don't have to always have a blow to the head. Mm -hmm. It can be your diet. Right. That can lead to now you needing an athletic trainer and you want that person to be empathetic and recognize, you know, all the different things that we're talking about. This is awesome discussion. Yes, and that's why implicit bias training is is extremely important. I know that um, in our current um, state of affairs um, in our society, we have certain states, and we definitely don't have the time probably to get into that, but we have certain states who don't see the importance of these um, discussions or um, trainings, um, but it is completely important because all of us um, have some level of bias, implicit bias, um, just based on our previous experiences in life. And sometimes they do, if we're not careful, infiltrate our interactions with others. And so when it comes to the healthcare profession, um, it is important for us to have self-awareness and um, know what our biases are so that we can um, control them and mitigate them and not allow them to have an impact on how we interact with our patients, how we interact with our colleagues or our peers um, to ensure that we don't do any harm. You know, if you are a healthcare provider, you've taken some type of oath to first do no harm. And that does include also, um, in my opinion, checking our biases at the door um, so that we can do that. We, if you've um, read any of the literature, you know that there are some um, beliefs about um, different race and ethnicities with regard to pain tolerance, for example. Um, and so we want to make sure, or, you know, chronic illnesses or conditions or who are going to um, experience them more than others. And so we have to make sure that having that knowledge doesn't allow us to have preconceived notions about patients as soon as they walk through the door, but that we um, truly treat people as individuals um, and see each patient as um, an individual patient and make sure that we are um, treating them and evaluating them according to whatever it is that they have, um, the information that they've disclosed to us as we start our examination process. Um, while we know that certain illnesses or injuries or conditions um, are more prevalent in certain um, groups of people, we still need to take an individualized approach. And so having the implicit bias training um, or any other um, training that deals with diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely important. Microaggressions training, for example, how to recognize it um, and how to um, um, address it if it occurs or how to not um, be a recipient of it or the, uh, for lack of a better word, um, perpetrator of uh, microaggression. So there's a lot of things that we have to consider as healthcare professionals. But um, as you said, some sometimes we are unaware, um, but having companies like the Kizo Effect <laughs> and other individuals come in to help um, do workshops and trainings can um, offset that. That's good. So, what type? I know your healthcare and in health education professions. I was just at a ground round at a local medical university here where we're talking about that medical education and why it's important to really integrate at that level because that sets the tone for the industry, mm -hmm. right? So, we're still talking about breastfeeding for residents and having spaces to do that, you know, and here we're talking about the athletic training component of this and what that looks like. So, you know, what what are some uh, companies or industries or groups, I don't know what the right adjective is here, that should be reaching out to you or, or that you would like to work with because this is so important if we want to turn the tide 
we can attack the, the federal beast, right? That's an uphill battle sometimes without a paddle. Or we can do a grassroots effort and start with what I like to say, our children, our youth, our young adults, those of us that are in training for different clinic professions. Like, who, who do you want to hear this message? Who do you want to reach out to you um, to get the support? Because I think that I believe the Kizo Effect is doing great work. I know we spent some time on traumatic brain injury and stroke, but you also talked about some other areas uh, that, you know, it just doesn't matter, I guess, what the diagnosis is. I thought mm -hmm. I'll just sum it up that way. Who do you want to uh, reach out to you? What areas should we be focusing on? And for those of you watching, come on, let's send this video out because this is important work. Yes. Um, well, first, before I, I let you know uh, specifically for the Kizo effect, I will say that um, health professions education, um, particularly um, those that I know of and have worked with, be it um, athletic training education, um, medical education, nursing, uh, physical therapy, um, and occupational therapy are um, organizations or academic um, entities that I have had the privilege of working with. We are all working to ensure that, as you said, on the grassroots level in our academic programs, we are allowing the opportunity for diversity, equity, inclusion, access, justice to be integrated into um, our academic programs. And a lot of the um, health professions that I just mentioned have um, academic standards in their educational um, programs that require um, the integration of diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. And so um, to that end, we are looking or working hard to make sure that we are um, in our academic programs, having our students address these issues early through either patient simulations, education, um, for example, to know how to make sure that they are treating our patients, or excuse me, um, evaluating our patients from a patient-centered, culturally relevant perspective. And so specifically in athletic training education, we do have um, diversity, equity, and inclusion standards um, embedded within our academic standards um, to make sure that we are teaching them before they come out. And as a educator, a former educator in athletic training programs, I can tell you that um, I would integrate it throughout all of my evaluation courses. So I, I taught a lot of the orthopedic assessment courses and um, I would integrate that in there. And in my, if I did problem-based um, learning, for example, with my students and we did case studies, the case studies would always have cult culturally relevant pieces a part of it in addition to whatever the the injury or the condition may have been to help the, the students know how they would approach it from that perspective as well. And then we would, um, as a group, through role play um, and other um, type of improvisations, we would look at how our students were treating um, the patient or evaluating the patient. Did they hit um, all of the aspects of the holistic evaluation. And I would have my students um, provide feedback to each other um, as well, not just hearing it from me only, but letting the students look at it. We had other patient simulation um, type of environments where they would look at um, two students doing an evaluation through a glass mirror and then provide feedback there as well or record it. Um, during the pandemic, it was huge. We, I had my students do recordings because every, all of the classes were online and um, I would send the recordings out or we would post them in our forum and the students would provide feedback that way. So we are making sure that we're integrating it from that grassroots um, level, as you mentioned. So I just wanted to mention that first. Now to answer the question about what types of organizations, um, definitely academic institutions. We um, service academic institutions to go in and either provide trainings or workshops, seminars. Um, it could be virtual or in person um, to just talk about how we can um, avoid microaggressions in clinical care or avoid microaggressions in um, health professions education, educational settings, um, how to, um, uh, recognize and mitigate implicit bias, for, for example, um, how to acquire relevant um, physical examination um, for patients. So um, academic institutions, we serve as academic in institutions, government agencies, hospitals, um, inpatient and outpatient clinics, um, private practice, um, private entities, 
Um, I can go into the armed forces or the military, um, uh, just any environment where you're going to be engaging with others, um, be it direct patient care, um, if it is um, employment settings um, or um, public entities, for example, we do workshops and trainings for um, anyone that is interested in learning how to become more um, diverse, how to um, have more inclusive practices, um, or um, to make sure that they are um, being equitable um, in their practices. I can service them all. That's awesome. I didn't even know about all those locations. So that's great. And it's just, I just want y'all to hear this is more than just the training piece. It literally is integrating into curriculum design, policy design, patient care simulations. That's remarkable. So I, I really hope that uh, people hear this and say, you know what, it's time. Regardless of what is happening in our nation, humanity is important. And let's figure out how we can do this well. That's really, really, really good. So, you know, I got to ask this question, right? Uh, is there a place for eating more plants, you know? <laughs> and all of this, because I'm telling you, my sister says, Pepper, that is not the answer to everything. And I always say, yes, it is. That's the answer to everything. That's how I recover so well. But okay. So in all that you're doing, um, I don't know if it fits on the employer side. I mean, working with the actual practitioners or the patient side as a clinician yourself. Where does eating more plant fit in and is it important? Absolutely. It is absolutely important. Nutrition is um, always important. And um, with um, I eat more plants, there certainly is um, an avenue for you in the world of uh, athletic training or healthcare in general, just because um, one size does not fit all. Let me say that first. And um, I do believe even with I Eat More Plants, we know that you are looking at um, helping people improve their quality of life um, in its totality, but then also through um, proper nutrition. And so when we, and, and that segues me into when it comes to exercise recovery, whether it is um, the person who is not injured, but they um, do um, exercise either high intensity exercise or even moderate um, exercise um, for that matter on a consistent basis, part of their exercise recovery has a nutritional component to it. And then those who um, are elite level athletes um, that athletic trainers will, will work with as well, uh, nutrition plays a huge role in um, recovering from exercise that way and or um, recovering from injury should an injury occur. So there is definitely room for I eat more plants. Um, what we need to understand, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but for those that are listening, um, proper nutrition definitely does aid um, in exercise and injury recovery. And it requires us to be able to think about how we balance our energy and we get our energy from food, um, um, from food sources through our caloric intake. And so just balancing out um, that energy becomes important. So eating too little or eating too much can have um, deleterious effects. So we want to make sure that we are looking at um, how much we're eating and what we're eating. Um, to that regard. So we want to integrate a variety of whole foods, which are going to include our pant, our plants, yes, <laughs> yes. our vegetables, our fruits <laughs> um, are extremely important. Our whole grains, um, we're looking at healthy fats is what we're going to need to inter integrate into um, our um daily eating and the food selections that we choose. And so that is where I believe I Eat More Plants can come in, um, particularly for those um, athletes or patients who um, are not sure about, you know, just how to integrate more into their diets. Um, depending on who you talk to, there may be some that say in order to um, have optimal performance and uh, more muscle gain and bulk, you know, high protein, high protein, high protein. Um, but <laughs> we automatically think one thing, right? We'll think, oh, high protein, 
more meats. And so I think that the opportunity to educate multiple protein sources can definitely be something that um, I eat more plants can do. In addition to showing the balance of the whole grains um, for the complex carbohydrates that are needed um, for energy to sustain long bouts of exercise or to sustain um, short but high intense spurts of exercise as well. So there's definitely an opportunity um, for nutritional education um, to come in and um, show them how they can balance all of that out. But it definitely deals with energy balance, um, integrating more varieties of whole foods um, into the diet, um, avoiding foods that are high in um, simple sugars or um, as well. So teaching them about that. Uh, we um, definitely advocate, advocate for individuals to replace electrolytes, right? Um, when they have high intensity or long bouts of exercise, um, and so people will automatically assume let's get Gatorade or Powerade or those types of um, juices or um, to replenish. But there are certainly a, a plethora of other ways that they can replenish those uh, electrolytes as well. So having you will come in to be able to talk about that and educate um, people in that regard would be good. Also, um, when we think about nutrition and um exercise recovery or an increased risk of injury when you think about it, if um, glycogen stores are depleted, okay, they won't be able to perform as well. Um, and that could increase a risk of injury. If they're dehydrated, for example, that can increase um, risk of injury and they won't perform as well. So having you or having individuals come in to talk about how that impacts them or a low, um, if they don't have enough iron in their diet, for example. There's a lot of things that definitely can be um, introduced and taught and 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 to help them understand that everything that I just mentioned um, can come through plant sources. It doesn't always have to come um, from other sources. And so definitely there is um, room for I eat more plants <laughs> when it comes to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, thank you for that, because I always say nutrition is the foundation of life. And we spend so much time on athletics. And as you were just talking, I was like, hello, basic chores around the house. If your iron and vitamin D are low, they are so important. It, I mean, that takes me on a whole osteoporosis prevention path, right? Just in that. But do you have the, the energy you need to do the things that you have identified you value in your life to prevent injury? We can go back to the older adult population and talk about preventing falls. Do they have strength to stand up straight? Are they doing exercises safely? Do they have the nutritional support to do that? It is all interconnected. And I think it's really important that we get back to basics and get back to what really we know works, which is eating food that is alive um, uh, when we put it on our plate, essentially. And uh, because in my opinion, that's, that's just how we were divinely designed. And that's how we thrive best. And... I can't, I can't, like you said, say it enough. It's just so important for injury prevention and recovery. And, and you can be eating all the plants in the world and still, you know, trip and fall or get into a car accident or, you know, you can't prevent every injury. But we're talking when we say injury prevention, like when you're engaging in intentional physical activity for recreation or competition or whatever like that. But that's that's really important. So this this message it do, doesn't just touch athletes; it touches all ages. You know, even for our children, like are they meeting their growth milestones? So, but yeah. we'll be talking about more of that on Friday, actually, at the nutrition masterclass. I hope yes, the parents yes. come out, <laughs> so we won't go yeah. there. And it's this just important to remember. It's just important to remember that poor nutrition um, is what. It, could potentially lead to the increased risk of injury. Um, but proper nutrition helps with recovery. And so that's the most important thing. And um, when we talk about diversity, I wouldn't be doing due justice if I don't if I don't talk about um, the diversity of nutritional um, needs or desires. And so we do have athletes that practice um, a plant-based diet only. 
Um, and so it becomes important for us as healthcare providers to also know and have knowledge about um, what their specific needs will be. That is inclusion right there as well. Um, that's equitable practices um, when you consider that as well. And where I may not have um, all of the knowledge, then I should have resources at hand. I eat more plants as a resource, right? Um, so we want to think about it to that end as well. Um, poor nutrition could potentially lead to increased risk and in injury, but proper nutrition helps us recover from those injuries. And that can be, as you said, the, F, the um, physically active population, or it could be um, sedentary individuals as well. But the most important thing is knowing that we need to meet the needs of all um, individuals. And, and we do have athletes who practice plant-based diets. Um, and so it becomes important for us to be knowledgeable in that area as well, or to know who to refer them to um, if we don't have um, the specific um, knowledge there. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, she just she just closed us out perfectly. You know, <laughs> she. I mean, and that's it, right? We can't expect our primary care doctors to have all the answers because they don't. They have so much that they're managing. But like you said, having those resources, knowing who to connect with, and it's okay. If you don't know the answer, that's why there are so many of us who have uh, passions to do different things so that we can work collaboratively, comprehensively together, like you're saying, to be inclusive and ensuring everyone's leading you know, the best life that they possibly can. You have been like a trendsetter in this mm -hmm. podcast community. Thank you so much for your time, your, your commitment to be here today to share with our community. How can people reach you? What is your website? And we'll put the details in, in the description, of course, for this. But uh, where can people reach you today if they wanted to connect? Sure. Um, so the website is www.thekizoeffect.com. And that's T-H-E-K-I-Z-O-E-F-F-E-C-T, -E -E all um, one word, dot com. Uh, we are on Instagram um, at Kizo, The Kizo Effect as well, um, and on Facebook, The Kizo Effect. If you'd like to send me an email, you can send it um, to info at thekizoeffect.com. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Carlita Warren, thank you so much for thank your you. time today. We appreciate you for joining In the Kitchen with the Plant-Based Nutritionista we are here to inspire you to take your health back one meal and decision at a time by eating more plants. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day. You're welcome.